You are watching the Fayetteville Government Channel. Up next, full coverage of the latest meeting of the Environmental Action Committee. The Environmental Action Committee is composed of citizen volunteers and meets on the third Monday of each month. The committee advises the City Council regarding environmental issues facing the City of Fayetteville and its residents. And now, the Environmental Action Committee. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, this is the Environmental Action Committee, and I am Sarah Marsh. I represent the citizens of Ward 1 on the Fayetteville City Council, and I chair the Environmental Action Committee. Let's start by doing introductions, if we want to go around the room. Aubrey? Uh, I'm Aubrey Shepard, and I'm a former outdoor writer and English teacher in several colleges in my career, but I've always been about uh, nature and conservation of natural resources. So that's why I'm, what I'm still working on far past retirement age here. I'm Richard Russell. I uh, live in Ward 1. I've uh, been in Fayetteville since 1961. Uh, I'm on the committee because I have a geology degree. Well, my name is Joe Kicklack. I live in Ward 4. I'm a University of Arkansas student and I'm on the committee because of my love of public service and all things Fayetteville. I'm James Barton. I'm a resident from Ward 3. I'm Connie Crisp. I'm a former English teacher. I didn't know you were one, Aubrey. I love that. And um, service learning, very much involved with uh, community work, Ward 1, and um, love everything about Fayetteville. Great. Yeah, go I mean, ahead. I'm Jesse Beeks. I work for the city of Fayetteville. I've been here for 30 years. Uh, we come to present tonight to program about uh, some of our experiences we've had using propane in the vehicles. You guys want to chime in? Okay. I'm Barbara Olson and I work with Jesse <coughs> and Fleet Operations. Yep. Terry Gully, I'm the Transportation Services Director for the city of Fayetteville. I'm the visitor, John Rule. I've been around Fayetteville since 1951. Okay. And I'm Peter Nierengarden. I'm the city's director of sustainability and strategic planning, uh, Ward 2 resident, and uh, staff representative on the uh, Environmental Action Committee. All right, thank you. Well, we're going to start by hearing from our fleet division about our pilot uh, propane project. So if you guys want to. Tell us about it. Okay. Uh, we've got a little slideshow. I can it. This thing's a black screen here. I want to tell you a, a little bit about what we've done. Uh, back in 2012, Dennis, okay, I can turn it, it on. <laughs> oh, I didn't turn it on. My former boss, uh, considered what alternative fuels and things we could do. Uh, the big word is CNG. CNG is not really available in the area without a lot of expense. We'll see a little bit of that here coming up. Uh, we decided to experiment with propane. These are some of our findings that we've gone through. This fat bill uses the clean propane fuel. <coughs> it was declared a Clean Fuel and the Clean Air Act of 1992. We're producing 60 to 70 percent less smog producing hydrocarbons. Uh, the numbers I'm getting 60 percent less carbon monoxide, 20 percent less nitrous oxide, and 12 percent carbon dioxide. Propane cuts emissions of toxins and carcinogens, benzene and toluene, by 80 to 96 percent. Those numbers are vary from different studies. So, the lawn industry, propane has 97% less particulates than gasoline-fueled mowers. That's something that we're mm -hmm. is a big program right now. And Jesse, is that on that last bullet point? Is that because in the lawn industry, those are two-cycle engines that some of them are. Or? I think they are included in that study. Okay, that is part of it. A few years ago, uh, they said a lawnmower puts out more soot and pollutants than it's 300 times more dirty than your car is. Okay. 
there's a slide later on that gives us a little better number. We get 70% of our, oh, 60% of all the propane comes from the oil processing. 40% comes from the natural gas processing. 90% comes from the United States. We're producing almost all the fuel that we're using right now. Canada is the second largest supplier. We get 7% of our propane from Canada. The United States has the largest storage of propane. Every state in the United States has several fueling facilities. That's one of the things that we won't see with CNG currently. The fuel rate is the same as gasoline. It takes about the same amount of time to pull up to the pump and fuel your vehicle with propane as it would if you pulled up and pumped gasoline. Propane has a 104 octane rating. It does burn very clean. Safety issues with propane. The air fuel mixture must be between 2.2% and 9.6% to burn. If it's outside of those parameters, propane will not burn. The ignition point is 940 degrees. Gasoline fumes ignite at 430 to 500 degrees. So does that mean propane is safer because it? It's harder to ignite than at gasoline. At a higher temperature? Yes, it ignites at a higher temperature. Propane won't contaminate your water. It won't contaminate the ground. When propane leaks, it dissipates into the air. <clears throat> it says propane doesn't puddle. Instead, it vaporizes and dissipates into the air. It can puddle for short periods of time, and then it will dissipate into the air. Propane uses a low pressure system, 200 PSI. Compressed natural gas is 3,600 to 4,500 PSI. Mm. Quite a bit more pressure. The propane tank is 20 times more puncture resistant than your gasoline tank on your car. The tank can withstand four times that rated pressure. Those are tested regularly. Propane vehicles are in service all across the country. Swans has been using propane for several years. They have more than 5,000 units out there. Raleigh, North Carolina started with 10 police cars. When they did their study, they went back and re retrofitted everything they had. City of Cincinnati started with 14. And basically what it is, is once you start, people start seeing some of the benefits and they get on the bandwagon. The school systems all over the United States are replacing their diesel buses with propane, mainly because it's low cost infrastructure. Compressed natural gas fueling station will cost you between 800,000 to $1.5 million, depending on your fill rate. And we have the city of Fayetteville. We also have propane vehicles in service. This is one of the first vehicles we put in. We put two of those in back in late 2012. Each truck, now the gasoline cost per mile is averaged over all of our small trucks. We're averaging 25 cents a mile just for fuel. Propane is costing us 16 cents per mile. We're saving 36% on the cost of fuel for every mile we drive. <clears throat> the gasoline displaced, this is for one truck, 1,773 gallons per year. The greenhouse gases, we're putting 12,000 pounds less greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's per truck per year. Here's our lawn mowers. I think most of them are here. This is what we're using to mow the parks. You probably saw them out there running. I haven't heard any complaints from the operators. They seem to be running fine. There's plenty of power. 
some of the emissions that uh, the different fuels are putting out there. Uh, the propane is the LPG. CNG is over here to the left. The infrastructure with CNG is so expensive, it's hard to get into that. Gasoline is up there. If you can't see the numbers, we've got some written down. <clears throat> the surprising one to me was electricity. It has no downstream, they call it, problems, but it's all in the generation. When they generate electricity, it's actually probably one of the dirtier fuels out there, apparently, according to this. I don't know how old this study is, but it's, it's, it's been out there a little while. So things may have cleaned up, I'm sure. But I think it depends. It varies greatly depending on your how you generate How it's generated, yeah, that's right. And right you Absolutely. Know, around here, the predominance of our generation comes from uh, coal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the natural gas is um, second, second to coal. So. That, that was surprising out there to me is how much pollutants were actually in there. <clears throat> Those mowers we saw, it cost $4.43 per hour to run that machine on gasoline. We're running propane on, we have seven mowers out there. They're averaging $3.16 per hour. For every hour that that machine runs, we're saving $1.27 on fuel. Again, that's 36%. Each mower will save 227 gallons per year based on our estimates of what they use in a year's time. This year may be different with a little more grass, but that's, that's going to be a pretty conservative estimate. Greenhouse gases, 1,487 pounds less gases per year per machine. That's each machine. We've got seven out there right now running on propane, so those numbers are out there pretty good. The lawnmower that we had mentioned there earlier, a lawnmower pollutes as much as 43 cars that drive 12,000 miles each per year. So that's a pretty good, pretty good savings on. The next transformation we did. This is an F550. This is a work truck. We typically use a diesel engine. We bought two of these units and we converted to propane. Diesel cost us 48 cents per mile on the diesel powered F550s. <clears throat> we do have one unit out there with some good information on. I hate to base anything on one unit, but that gasoline powered truck cost us 50 cents per mile to run that truck. Propane is costing us 40 cents per mile. So we're saving over diesel or gasoline. The figures we got when we displaced the diesel, that truck, one truck in one year, will save us 2,263 gallons per year. <clears throat> There's 15,000 pounds less greenhouse gases for that truck, for each truck, for one year. Gasoline, according to those numbers, gasoline would be even higher. I didn't do the figures on gasoline. <clears throat> Propane cost last week August the 14th, we were paying $1.53 per gallon. Gasoline at the same time was $3.29. Diesel was $3.34. We're estimating the tank and the fueling system to put one on site, $30,000 to $35,000. And we can have fueling on site, make it much more convenient fuel for us to use. The conversion to convert these vehicles is from six to nine thousand dollars. The lawnmowers was from five to nine hundred. Those are different mowers. Uh, ours cost, I think, about six hundred dollars to convert our mowers over. 
So when you <coughs> say the cost of the delivery system in the tank is estimated, do we not have a tank and delivery system? We do not. We're fueling off-site right now. Okay. Amerigas has the old station down behind the shop on mm -hmm. uh, Armstrong. Okay. We're using that for a fueling station now. They've went out of business. They've left their tank and stocked it there. We're having issues with billing and trying to keep everything right. We're having to write everything down on paper. They bring it down. If we can put it on site, we can use our fuel system and log it in, and we'll know exactly how much they use when they do it instead of waiting for the paperwork to get turned in and hopefully not lost. Okay. So, hasn't been an issue so far, but. Some of the savings that, that we're looking for, the diesel engine upgrade, when I buy a truck like that F550, that diesel engine will cost me anywhere from eight to $13,000 just to add that to the truck. Each mower converted, we're gonna get a $1,000 rebate when we buy a new mower and that's converted to propane. We're getting a rebate, we should be getting a rebate for each gallon of fuel we used. 50 cents a gallon <clears throat> is coming back because we are using a clean fuel. That's something we don't have that in hand yet, so I have not included that. That figure does not figure into these estimates. Those are strictly the numbers we're paying right now. Do you, you get the, the um, rebate from the federal government? We do, okay. yes. Those will come back at the end of the year. We'll turn our paperwork in for how much fuel we've paid and they'll write us a check. We hope it's that so, easy. But. So those are or not included in your, your estimate? This 50 cents per gallon is not included in these numbers. So all our numbers will go up once we actually get all the paperwork turned in. You mean they'll get better? Numbers will get better. So, oh, okay, so yeah. those are, let me make sure I understand this. So. That's not included. The rebate part is not the included. rebate. Not now the rebate for each lawnmower uh -huh. is included. Well, it's it, I'll show you here. Okay. Because we did receive a thousand dollars per mower. We have a five thousand dollar check that we deposited for buying new lawnmowers with propane system on. Them. That pays for our conversion and all that stuff. And that's a federal grant. Those are federal. Is this under, who does this, environmental? That was the Propane Education Research Council is where the $1,000 and lower came from. Okay. <clears throat> now, a used lawnmower is not, you have to be a new lawnmower. Oh, and you can get a, there's a, there's a $500 rebate for a used mower, but it's got to meet a lot of criteria, and it can only be so old it, it basically almost has to be new also so it has to be new and then you convert it or someone convert you can buy it convert you can now buy you can them buy converted, converted yes. and you'll still get your thousand dollars yes yeah if we put in a fueling station there is a rebate out there for up 30 percent up to thirty thousand dollars for a fueling station if we can build one on site Some of the things we're looking at in the future, these things are, uh, we do have two kits ordered for some staff Tahoes. We've got two of those out there for staff to drive. Police, uh, police chief has okayed testing three units on his units, three uh, kits on his units to see how they work. So. We think that's gonna be a pretty good program too. <clears throat> As I said, three kits have been approved by the police chief. Propane for each unit. Now these are estimates based on the miles they drive and the numbers that we've got. We don't have hard numbers here. These are estimates that we think are pretty close. We're looking to displace 3,300 gallons of gasoline in a year's time for each vehicle we convert. Fuel savings are estimated $1,840. <clears throat> the greenhouse gas reduction 
is 20,677 pounds. So on uh, the fuel savings and the greenhouse gas reduction, is that uh, for all of them or each individual? One. Or one this unit? is one, one unit. Everything here is one unit. Each one we can convert. Now these are the police Tahoes. That's our estimate for police because they're a high, higher mileage vehicle. <clears throat> now some of our the staff Tahoes that we were talking about that I mentioned earlier, they don't drive that kind of miles. Mm -hmm. We'll see some savings, but they won't be quite as pronounced as these. Okay, but it costs 9000 to convert it. Is that what you said earlier? These things, uh, the ones we have now, we're looking at almost six for the kit. Uh, the installation is 1,000 to 15. We've got to get that done for the first couple. Hopefully after that, we'll have some certification for our guys and we can install them ourselves. So, so we'll be looking 6, at 000. close to $6,000, just slightly less than $6,000. So if you round up and say that's a $2,000 fuel saving, it's, it takes three years to right. pay back. Do they right. keep the vehicle three years or is it? Each vehicle. We keep the vehicle. The projected life on these vehicles is five years. Okay. We're looking to get five and hopefully maybe just a little more. We're looking at five. That's our plan. Whoop. If we figure up diesel is $3.40 a gallon, a 10-year life, an F550 will save us $2,076 per year. We should see a payback in two years on those kits. We're looking at 150,000 pounds of CO2 less over the life of that vehicle. This is a lifetime figure. Gasoline is $3.29 a gallon, estimated five year life. The police Tahoe $1,840 a year, pay back in three years. <clears throat> it's going to save 103,335 pounds of CO2 over the life of that vehicle. This is each vehicle. And that's also assuming that fuel costs stay at $329 and $348. It is. The higher, the higher that fuel price goes up, Payback. the better we are. Well, propane the, can go up too, can't it? Propane can go up also. It, it, a lot of places propane is higher than that now. We kind of have a, a locked in price until our time limit here is over. If we get a fueling station, we also have a little more buying power, so maybe we can hedge that price a little bit. What, Jesse, what have you seen propane prices do last three to five years compared to gasoline prices? They have similarly followed a little behind, but not in the extent. They're a little more level mm -hmm. than uh, than gasoline prices. Okay. Okay. They do occasionally go up, but it's slightly compared to gasoline. Mm -hmm. Not nearly as volatile pricing. You don't see them steadily trying to catch up to gasoline prices as propane not more popular. No, no. But pop, propane's not real popular right so, now. It's getting on there. It really is. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. One of the things that. I made this slide last week and uh, for some reason I didn't see it till last night. <clears throat> we figured that top one at diesel at $3.40 a gallon for a 10 year life and, and a two year payback. The minute we put that thing on, we've already paid for it because I didn't buy the diesel engine for $8,000. I put a $6,000 kit on it. So I'm $2,000 ahead before I even start as far as saving money. That's because we're not converting diesels to propane, mm -hmm. we're converting gasoline, gasoline F550s engine. to propane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the gasoline trucks cost us $8,000 less. Mm -hmm. That's good. How do you figure that CO2 output? On the, I don't remember which one it was, there is a you know, alternative fuels data center has a calculator because if it's cleaner burning mm -hmm. 
you know, when you, clean burning fuels go to water and CO2. Mm -hmm. So if it's clean burning, it ought to actually put out more CO2 and fewer other compounds. Well, and that's for this one. I think I listed CO2 here, and I may have confused that with greenhouse gases. The other surveys, when I went back here, it, it states greenhouse gases. And CO2 is part of... Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the chemistry. You know, how, how can you have a cleaner burning fuel? I mean, what's, what am I missing that is in that cleaner burning fuel should be going to carbon dioxide and water and nothing else? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the perfect equation. A dirtier so, fuel would burn to what? The the nitrates of uh, oxides of nitrogen Oxide. and, and those... carbon monoxide and, and okay. so it's a it's a. And are those greenhouse gas considered greenhouse gases as yeah. well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like maybe. I'm just trying to understand the chemistry, yeah. and you know. I, well, there's what, a balance. This right? slide was was there. I may have overlooked that. The others did say greenhouse gases, the ones that well, I looked you've, at. you've consistently said throughout here, and I'm not disputing your statistics. Yeah. I'm sure you didn't, yeah. you didn't create them, but just trying to understand the process. How can we take, convert from one fuel to another mm -hmm. and have it be a cleaner burning fuel and you know, run the same number of miles and produce less carbon dioxide? You know, where's the where's the energy coming from where's the you know we're burning stuff so it's it's got to produce carbon dioxide the propane atom has less carbon than any of the other hydrocarbon fuels there's uh c3h8 is the the propane formula uh but but the burning process is breaking those chemical bonds apart right. so breaking them apart. having fewer carbons doesn't really fix it you just have to burn more atoms to uh, to accomplish the same the same thing it does yes why don't you just check on those numbers i can do that we'll have peter report back to you yeah next month. will that work yeah okay I'm, I'm, doesn't okay. It just be a misprint you got the so. number let me write that down one of the things when you guys presented this to council a year or so ago was about the uh, status of, of uh, propane as a it's wasted currently. It's burned mm -hmm. out of the wellhead. So the emission, whatever emissions occur in that situation, in the process of wasting, uh, that's saved from, from the atmosphere mm -hmm. as well as what we're doing by using them. So it, it's a win-win, according to the way it's been explained in the past. Well, I'm not disputing with it. I mean, those looks like a real smart thing to do. You know, why aren't we doing it faster? That's the, that's the, the, the question that comes to mind. But that's one of the one of the things we want to do is to put in a fueling station and and move forward with some more vehicles. What we've seen is some good good results with the uh, with the cost per mile, cost per hour. Do you have a plan to put in the fueling station? Is it in the budget, or do we need to find that? We do have money in the budget. Uh, we've got to get everybody's approval. Okay. Uh, we're working with the fire department to make sure it's okay with them and where we put it, and uh, we're looking at some different alternatives to what size we need, how fast we're going to grow, and what okay. we need. We are trying to move forward with it. So it's not the final. Hopefully soon. Pardon me. Is, so that it's not the funding holding you back. No, we've got the we've got some money there for that, but we just want to get all the get everything in okay. order Great. when we go. Sir, one of the things you're going to see is we're getting ready to bring an agenda out, and we it'll be uh, two weeks. Okay. It'll be on the council in two weeks because we've got to amend the ordinance because there's a ban okay. on above. Here, you may want to actually come above up here. ground. So the microphone pick you up. There's a ban on above ground propane tanks in town. Oh, okay. So yeah. what we're going to do is get that changed so they can, you can have it if you uh, are using it exclusively for fueling vehicles. Okay. So that will allow us to do that. Then once we do that, we plan on buying it. Our time frame is 
to get that done so we can take advantage of that 30% rebate and get $10,000 that way and get a third of this thing essentially paid for. Uh, so that's going to be hot on the table to get that done before the end of the year because that's when that expires. Great. So now, all the Tahoes that we just approved the purchase of, were those di diesel or are those? They're, all, they're gasoline. Gasoline. And okay, they're all so they planning to be converted. Yeah. Every Excellent. one of them is planning on being converted. Yeah, that's some of our potential. Some for the police. You know, we were doing those to try and convince the police, let's try that because there's, if we eventually get to where that's our fleet, mm -hmm. that's like 30 yeah. some police cars, that yeah. we could convert all of them to that is our yeah. long range plan. And then uh, fire chief, one of those was for the fire chief. Mm -hmm. So we're even getting him to do it. So we've got their buy-in on, they're not gonna blow up, they're safe. Mm -hmm. They're, they're really more safe. They're more puncture resistant and all that. So the plan is to crank this thing up. We're not really planning on waiting. We've seen the results. We're gonna present it here. And our plan is to, to do those Tahoes, get the police started. Uh, I've got some more Colorados. We've got more uh, 550s coming. We're gonna to continue to spend 8,000 less on diesel engines and have that paid for. So essentially our payback on that is immediate. It starts. Yeah. So uh, we don't feel like there's a long-term real chance of propane going above the cost of gasoline anytime soon, but we have a backup plan for that because every vehicle we're buying is a gasoline vehicle. And then it has the option of running on propane. If gasoline got more expensive than the uh, propane, we just run gasoline. Okay. It, it still will do both. So what is involved in the conversion? There's a kit that there's injectors that they modify the intake. They inject the propane right into the intake right just before it goes into the cylinder. Okay. And, and it burns it just like it would vaporized gasoline. And, and the gas tank and the gas lines stay in the vehicle, so... Everything's there. You just, I like it. You got a valve or something that you have to The fuels that twist. we... It's automatic. You don't even know it can't tell when it changes. So the current yeah. ones we got, they start on gas, warm up a little bit, and automatically switch. And they're gonna run on propane. If you ran out of propane and didn't get back, you would just automatically switch back to gasoline. You'd never know you did it. Then you'd fill up both tanks. Whoa. But uh, you know, like on the Tahoes, you take the spare tire from out, how they fit under a truck or an SUV, you take that out, put that in the back of your car, and the, the propane tank is the shape of a spare tire. And so you've still got your gasoline tank that you bought, just like anybody goes and buys a regular Tahoe. And then you've got a propane system right on board too. Then where do you put your spare tire? And you can put it in the back. Okay. Yeah. Are you on the fire department? You're just talking about the fire chief's fire truck, chief. not the, the, not fire, the chief. fire truck. Fire chief is he's replacing his vehicle, and we decided and to do that. Do that with so that. Could, just could you replace things like fire trucks? That's a, a big engine with a lot of horsepower. They typically run diesel. There is, they are working now to modify some diesel engines when they're loaded under a load that they can inject propane. It's not a full on conversion, but it's kind of a helper to boost the horsepower and it displaces some of that diesel fuel that they would normally use. It's not big right now, it's still kind of out there, but some well, places are using it. Sure, the research R and D is going to be on it. Yeah, I mean they're doing yeah. it for CNG for garbage yeah. trucks. A lot of garbage trucks. Are they on are. That. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm sure it's just a matter of time that okay. the propane industry is going to. They're going to fund a lot of research to do it because they sure. see the ability to sell it. So. So um, right now we don't have the ability to do the garbage. Not trucks. not with large trucks and. and I mean, we went, I, Jesse and I went to a meeting with the North Wales Arkansas Council talking about CNG and talking about that. But the big problem with that is it's $801.5 million to get one station. Mm -hmm. And then it's a slow fill process. I mean, uh, that's to, to get one pump. So imagine if you're trying to fill 34 garbage trucks like we've got. You know, and it takes uh, 20 minutes to do a fast fill, which doesn't even fill them to 100% capacity. 
you know, it's an all night long process to do that. So I don't see how that's feasible at this time. We, I told them they were wanting to do this as a Northwest Arkansas group, but until it becomes feasible, we, I just flat stated we're not willing to wait. We feel like we've got a viable option now and we want to move forward with that. We can evaluate that for the larger vehicles mm -hmm. if it would become possible later on. I have an, another qu a question about propane that just for me to understand this. So I know that propane is used in place in rural areas where they don't have natural gas. Is that correct? We're talking yeah. about the same kind of propane with the tanks on top and things like that. And you said that Fayetteville does not allow tanks above ground tanks. above ground because I they have grandfathered uh, they haven't allowed an above ground tank since 1989. Uh, I think it was 89 somewhere in there. Okay, just. The there's no the new utilities. installations okay i think it's, in most places natural gas is available right yeah. if it's and available it, yeah, it's then all underground right. and sure. it's uh, okay. it's similar in in what it provides uh they're unsightly right so it's yeah, more of, of, a, um, of a i'm sure in the aesthetic. older days they were more dangerous than they are now right. you know they've developed better and better things over time but it's just made a made a movement back then to, to try and get rid of those. Rid it's of more them. of a rural thing as yeah. the other services were provided. It's kind of like sewer. You know, they don't want sure. you on septic if we've got sewer. If you've got it. Um, so that my second question is, uh, in rural areas when they build, it seems like lately, and I, I've known this from experience with several people, um, that builders will say electricity is less expensive than propane. You know anything about that? Well, okay. I, I just I wanted to know what. I built in Madison County. I've got, I've got a propane tank uh -huh. that runs my cook stove. That's all it runs, and I have no natural gas available. And uh, I heat with wood, so I was using it as a backup plan. So, so I, it's, it's electric it's, is my backup plan rather gas. than propane. Well, that I didn't I mean, really want a thousand gallon propane tank set in my right, house. right. Okay, but, so you don't you know, know I think, really. I, I think it's all the systems you buy. Um, I heard it every direction. You've heard, you know, okay. According to which mm -hmm. salesman you were talking to. Okay. So I don't know what the facts actually are. And it's actually not that new concept to run vehicles off of propane. No, I, I grew up working for my dad in Arkadelphia, and we had um, uh, forklifts that were propane fueled. And we have those already. Yeah, primarily because of the cleaner burning fuel you're inside a lot with a forklift, yeah. you know, gasoline, just things No exhaust and confined space. Yeah. And, and, you know, and propane kind of made a go at it, what, 20 years ago? But they were doing yeah. it with carbureted systems. They didn't have the fuel injection systems they have now. So they did not work nearly as well and got a bad reputation. And I think if that hadn't occurred until the fuel injectors came along, it'd be further along than it is, but a lot of people tried it, it didn't have the greatest of results, where now they're refining it more and more every, every month. So. There's one of the, the propane vehicles weren't, how are they different today from the 70s and the 80s? And that's one of the things they said, the technologies have changed significantly. Uh, the improvements in the injection system has, has opened this up to, they can do a lot with it now. They can tune that engine per cylinder, each individual cylinder based on if they want to. It's really, technology has really moved forward with this, so. Yeah, this system has essentially its own computerized it system. It does. Just like yeah. our car north does for gasoline, this has one for the propane. So they match everything up to the, they can fine tune it. Mm -hmm. With all the stuff, it, it, some of the question why why don't more vehicles run on propane? And currently, there are 14 million vehicles running worldwide right now. Uh, recently, the Americans have started looking at alternative fuels. Is the what they're telling us here? Hundreds of thousands of vehicles running on it. Delivery fleets, school buses. School buses a big thing. If you read anything, school buses are big right now and converting to propane. Taxi cabs have always been, and, and a lot of police fleets are really going to it. There's there's very little difference in any of this uh, maintenance as far as the technician training, 
there's there's very little differences between that and the gasoline engine that you normally run anyway so we don't have a lot of new training to do uh, the price is cheap the gas or the propane now is cheaper and with the police fleet or any kind of a large fleet you have 20 or 30 vehicles and they're all the same and you buy one kit and pretty soon you just it's almost like an assembly line well it sounds like a win all around but what are you finding any drawbacks are there any disadvantages to, to the program not so far okay. i haven't seen anything no one thing you hadn't talked about is too is they're seeing is a a lot better engine life out of these where they're taking you know a vehicle that's around seventy five thousand miles and they pull it apart and it's run on gas you've got carbon all in your valves and everything else where you're saying if you take one of these apart they look like they were just came off the assembly line they don't have any buildup it's burning cleaner it's burning hotter and just much better it's wear and tear on the engine so if you've got less of those things in there you've got less dirt in your oil your oil may run longer because it stays cleaner as long as your viscosity is good and it's lubricating you can maybe lengthen that so there's an additional savings by running cleaner that way also and we're changing oil less and having to dispose of used motor oil less right. so it's got a lot of things going on that way too so I, we're not finding anything wrong with it that's why we're pretty much looking anything we're replacing in the fleet if we have the option to convert it to propane that's what we're we're headed for we, we think this is pilot has worked out great and it's like yeah let's let's do it faster great i think i remember a discussion about a year ago um when this we were talking about this in this committee um and there was a discussion that it will only work in certain parts of fayetteville because of the topography is was that the case ever or is that the case no now? i i don't think the only thing I can think of that affected, the topography affected, was we had a, a garbage truck with a hydraulic assist. Hydraulic launch assist. Yeah, and, and we determined that works much better on flatland, so Ward 4 is a much better area for that, where it builds up pressure as you're stopping, so it helps launch, uh, launch the truck off so you don't have to hit the gas hard down. We found that in uh, when you're going up Rockwood picking up garbage, you're never building up the pressure. It worked fine coming down the hill, but it doesn't work going up the hills at all because it won't build up the pressure to help do that. And it was uh, like a forty thousand, thirty or forty thousand yeah. dollar add-on, and we couldn't justify doing it. So we moved the one truck we had to the west side of town, and we're seeing a little bit better it's improved fuel mileage mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Uh, Timing of y'all's presentation. Um, are you just looking for a recommendation? No, we just mostly. Or? We thought that's from you would be interested okay. in. We yeah. wanted to get to you. We are going to ask for the propane exemption to get the propane tank down at the shop. We put it by our other diesel and gas tanks, and be able to fill there, which allows them to put fuel point on it, and it allows them to have a better ability to measure our mileage and and results that we're getting. So that was just coming. You'll see it in a week. You'll be the most educated council person there at that meeting on that <laughs> particular item. So sell it. Help us sell it. All right. And then, um, so. no, that's all that. And then we're looking to buy this, buy this fueling station by the end of the year, so we can reap that ten thousand dollar benefit. But you will also see at council, we're going to have to bid out the propane kits. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to do several vehicles, then it's going to be over twenty thousand dollars. So we'll have to get formal bids on the propane kits at the top of the spec. So, okay. so you'll be seeing that, and that. probably on other kinds of trucks too. Yeah. Great. All right. Yes, sir. Do the propane kits have a service life? You don't retrieve them and use them again. I think we can on some of these vehicles. Uh, some of the injectors they told us the life was indefinite, and they told us when we bought these that yes, we could do that. Uh, uh, right now uh, we've only got these in the newer vehicles by the time we get seven eight years on some of these vehicles uh, as with a lot of things technology may be so old they may have something new and improved out there that does even better it's something we'll have to look at when when that time comes we won't know that until we take the first one off <laughs> evaluate can we 
reuse that. But yeah. we, we haven't gone through the cycle of any of the longest one on and been on a year yet. Reselling. Well, potentially what we can reap is if we leave it on the vehicle and sell it yeah. as a dual fuel vehicle, we may get $2,000 more for that vehicle, even though it's got 140,000 miles on it, than we would have got for an equal vehicle with, with just the single yeah, fuel. So fuel that, might, that might enrich your so, numbers. So we may be better off to do that, get the 2,000 and apply the 2,000 to maybe the way technology like that tends to go, it tends to go cheaper later than it does if it's anything Mm -hmm. with electronics in it, it might get cheaper in a few years than it is now. So that would just be something we have to evaluate at that time. We look at all those parameters when we make that decision. The current savings here, this is the units that we have in service right now. We have two of the small intermediate pickups, two F-550s, and we have seven lawnmowers out there. This year, on the fuel that we're running, the, these these units are running, the, the city employees drove these, these units today. This is what we'll see at the end of the year. We'll save almost $10,000 a year just in the fuel. That's uh, all units combined, right? All units combined. This is the only slide where everything is combined. Everything else was per unit. We do have in hand that $5,000 rebate we received for the mowers. We will have saved 5,485 gallons of gasoline that we're not gonna be burning. There's 4,526 gallons of diesel. And we're looking at 64,400 pounds of greenhouse gases not emitted into the atmosphere. Job. <laughs> this is this is one unit and this is the units that we have out there. They're running right now today. They mowed grass, they they hauled people and equipment to the job site. That's what we have on hand right now. If we can increase this in the future, those numbers will get better. Anyone have any further questions? If, what was the figure you gave? Did you give a figure about how much money is spent nationally on mowing grass? No. Uh -uh. no. Some figure you gave on what we were spending, the city. What we, we received? How much, no, how no. much money right now is being spent either by the city or both, but we by the city or nationally? We don't. We, national didn't, we didn't present anything about no. that. Okay, I, so don't I don't have any figure uh, on that. I don't have that number. You, you don't know how much the mowers have been using, costing. How much they're being used? So how much our fuel and so forth mowers have been costing per year in fuel. Yeah. That that must have been what you. The we we're, we're burning, the gasoline, just the gasoline to run that mower, is four dollars and forty three cents per hour. Right. So we're the gasoline displays, so I'd say we're running about 227 gallons of gas through each mower per year. Well, uh, this is, yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. we're replacing yeah, it with propane. That's right, we were replacing so. it with propane, yes. We have about how many mowers? Seven. seven. Well, we have seven on propane. Than, We've got more than that. We've got more than yeah. that. Okay. We have seven that we're new enough to try this on. Oh, okay. We've got seven that's exactly alike, which anytime we're doing this, the more like we can be on them easier it is to, yeah. to do them. Did y'all buy those with the kits on them already or did you retrofit those? We did those last five. Those five we bought with the kits oh. already installed. They were dealer installed. We, we look at this on, you know, how much, you know, like we're not going to go in and, re and put a propane system on every truck we have in the city because some of them are one year old or brand new, yes, but a seven year old truck or a nine year old truck that replaces it 10 years, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna wait till they cycle around and come back around and they're new and we'll look at doing that. Plus on anything other than the small trucks like meter trucks, we've got one on the meter truck, one on that small truck in my division. And uh, But the 550s are almost exclusively diesel through the fleet. We're just now made the decision. Uh, we were not getting our bang for a buck out of that because we literally don't run them down the road enough to ever kind of blow the soot out of them. They idle more than they run down the road. 
and we, we can get by with the load capacity we have, the gas will provide enough energy to, to pull the loads we need to pull. Most everything we pull with larger trucks. So, so we evaluate all that. The newer stuff up to a couple of years old, if it's a 10 year life truck, we may go ahead and do it. But we're gonna get to a point where where's it cost effective to do it. Part of the savings is we're saving $8,000 by not buying a diesel engine. That makes our cost quick if we, we can't convert the diesels. So we have to wait till they get to a gasoline source. Okay, well we need to move on. Is there any final questions? Well, thank you so thank much. You very much. It's very interesting. All right. I'm glad to see this program in action. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Council Member Petty has come to talk to us about the Green Revolving Loan Fund proposal. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jesse. Um, with the resolution. Do you want to start with the resolution up or the uh, explanatory sheet? Uh, however, I'll just kind of do it at the same time. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have my paperwork. I'll try to do this from memory. You want, you want mine? Oh, that's okay. It'll be a good okay. test. I just came from story time, so that's why, if you excuse my unpreparedness. Um, <laughs> well, I know a few of you, but um, many of you I haven't met before. I represent Ward 2, uh, Central Fayetteville, and um, a few months ago, uh, at a local conference, um, I was introduced to kind of a uh, advanced idea of green revolving loan funds on a panel that um, Older Women Marsh uh, moderated, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, whenever that idea came back up there, uh, it kind of got the balls rolling. Maybe we should do something like that here, and sooner rather than later. So I'll start kind of from the basics and then I'll end with what I think is um, something we should pay a little bit more attention to when we really dive into this. Um, a revolving fund is just a fund dedicated to a specific purpose where you take at least 50% of uh, the savings you get from the projects and you revolve it back to new projects. So typically these are projects that get you some kind of return. In this case, we're talking about operational savings. So for example, it costs us about $600,000 a year to keep street lights on. Uh, and if we were to replace those with LED street lamps, uh, that'd be a lower bound of savings of 40% or about $230,000 every year, uh, which you, know, you can use to hire full-time employees or put that into new streets or new sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, another example is our buildings. Uh, you know, we have a lot of buildings that the city owns. Uh, if you just look at ones that were last built or, or built or last renovated before 1991, there's about 340,000 square feet of air conditioned space that fits that, uh, those conditions. And if we were to renovate those to be more efficient, we'd have a lower bound of savings of about 10%. Uh, I can't tell you what that is in a dollar figure because actually, as Peter knows, we have no way, we have no energy dashboard. We have no way of telling how much energy we're using citywide in our buildings. Um, but we know the savings is there, the potential is there, so it's compelling at least. Uh, this has been a real popular model at universities uh, to take some of your cash reserves or your endowment in the case of universities and dedicate it to a revolving fund for these kinds of purposes, for resource efficiency projects, typically energy, but also renewable energy projects or even projects to save paper. Uh, a uh, uh, organization called the Green Billion Campaign uh, looked at universities and they looked at more than 50 universities revolving funds there and they found that it's up there. Um, the median statistics for those university funds, uh, median project payback period was four years and the median return on investment annually was 32%. So this is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, if we were to put $500,000 into a fund out of our reserves, that would be an annual return on, on investment of about $150,000 a year. Um, so again, nothing to sneeze at. You know, that's uh, a little bit more than two of our average full-time employees or, or full-time employees at average salaries. Uh, the great thing about these is you can bake an administrative fee into it from the beginning. You can include uh, inflation adjustments as they go because you're having these project savings pay back into the fund so you can account for it from the beginning, which means it's protected against the future. It's future proof. So if, for example, we were to have that fund established today 
and we saw 2% inflation for the next 10 years. In 10 years, we'd have a fund portfolio worth $612,000, be worth the same amount in today's dollars. Um, there's multiple ways to do this. So the mayor, by order, could tomorrow uh, have all the division uh, managers start spending money on projects and accounting for their savings explicitly in the budget and rolling 50% of those savings forward. That's really all it takes to do a revolving loan fund. But I think what becomes really neat about these things, what the real opportunity is, uh, is if we establish this like we do our shop fund, which you just heard a little bit about. You know, our shop fund uh, takes basically depreciation costs and maintenance costs and pulls that together for all the departments so that we can manage all of our shop expenses in one place so we can account for them in one place this would do the same thing for efficiency projects if we do that it means that we can take that other 50 percent that isn't getting revolved and we can decide as a city what we'd like to do with it so we can do a lot of different things with it maybe we only want to hire new staff and that's okay maybe we'd like to dedicate it to something else um, there's an interesting model this is the one i learned about in the panel uh, a few months ago, it's called Project Heal. So it's pioneered by the Clinton Foundation and L'Oreal in Little Rock. And the way that worked is they, same basic concept where they took the last 50% and they used it to uh, basically guarantee loans. They partnered with a banking institution to actually make the loans and they guaranteed those loans with that 50%. And those are employee loans. So employees who live in a home that could benefit from an energy efficiency project were able to get a loan even if they had bad credit based on their tenure at the at l'oreal and based on l'oreal being able to offer up that other savings as a guarantee for the loan it's very successful to put this in environmental terms each one of those families on average save 2.2 tons of carbon emissions a year which if you use national averages that's a little less than half uh, or it's the equivalent of driving almost half as much, not quite half as much, but almost half as much. Uh, so it's a big deal that way too. And they also had uh, average savings of, what is that, is that up there? I think it's about $614 a year, which doesn't sound like a whole lot um, to one family, but in aggregate, it really makes a big difference. So if Fayetteville were to take the lead to do a heel model and then to, uh, put together an industry coalition where we could do this all over town, 1,000 employees means an annual economic impact of $614,000, if that's the figure. It's up there somewhere. I don't see it on the screen right there. Um, it might be at the bottom. $416,000. I got my numbers backwards. So $416,000 a year annual economic impact from 1,000 employees, which is the equivalent of um, one high-end retail business on the square in aggregate, or about two uh, small family-operated service businesses. So, you know, this, this is a real deal if we go through with that. Um, there are more than 25 states that have green revolving funds. We already have one for residential loans, but we don't have one for interdepartmental loans. So it's the right thing to do for residences, uh, but for interdepartmental loans, it provides the opportunity for us to get some operational savings. This is important because, I know this is the Environmental Action Committee, but I'm sure social causes are important to a lot of you as well. Um, you know, we balance the budget on the back of our employees for the last six years or so, seven years, since 2006. They only got their first raise since 2006 last year. And if you look at the cash reserves we've acquired and you compare that to the kinds of raises they would have received, it's almost exactly equal. So we really did balance the budget on their backs. And if we plan to give raises to our employees like we should in the future, we're able to cash flow everything now, but we're broke come 2017. We start to go more in the red. And so we really need to take a close look at how the operations work and how we could really make an impact there. And this is one of those ways. You know, we have, even if we were to give raises, we have about two million right now that we could choose to spend on things that would make an impact like that. And so I think 500,000 is um, appropriate. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Alderman Marsh knows a lot about this, and Peter studied it a little bit too. Uh, I'd really like to get your endorsement for this, and uh, if you endorse it, I hope Alderman Marsh would co-sponsor it as well. Yes, I would absolutely do so. I'd be honored to. Now, I really like that what this could do for our employees, uh, because by making these investments, you know, it's not just good for the environment. The 
you know, with the energy savings that they'll see, but that's a benefit that keeps giving to them. Um, and you know, those lower utility bills, even, uh, let's see, we say $416 a year, you know, that's like 40 bucks a month or something. You could take your family out to dinner or it just, it gives them some more flexibility, and, and I think it promotes their loyalty to us as well. It shows that we care. So I think it has a very good social impact as well. But as far as projects that we could use the Green Revolving Loan Fund for, you know, they'd mentioned the streetlights. Um, if we hadn't already had some money for the uh, propane tanks, you know, that would have been a good uh, project because it has such a short payback period. And, and it's, if it's my understanding, we're, we're trying to target things first with a shorter payback period of four years or less. That would be my preference. You know, a lot of those decisions, mm -hmm. um, it's a little premature to decide on them now because we don't even have the fund. But I think that's the right approach to take because if we do give those raises, we're looking at 2017 as being a year that we would be running a deficit again. And uh, if the median project pay payback period is four years, that means there ought to be quite a few projects that have a payback period of three years or less. And we can find those out. Um, the implement implementation steps for doing this are first uh, to come up with a list of compelling projects that warrant a cost benefits analysis. And second, to conduct an energy audit on uh, some of the oldest buildings that we have that are air conditioned. Um, if we were to do an energy audit on uh, those buildings um, that I mentioned earlier run us, it's really hard to say, it's a very soft number, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $80,000, give or take. And to get an energy dashboard, what did you price that at, Peter? Uh, we're taking a recommendation to the next city council meeting to spend $9,400 on, on basically a utility management software okay. that allows to wrap our hands around all of our util monthly utility bills. Right. So there is a little bit of an initial expense to get started and to create that project list, but once you have that list and you get work, work, working on things, you start to see the paybacks right away. And by the way, these aren't um, fly-by-night institutions that have done this. If you'll scroll down just a little bit, you see the list of universities and states is quite impressive. and. Uh, I didn't leave the whole list up there, but I wanted to put Mississippi in there because Arkansas doesn't have one. Uh, so this isn't one of those times we can thank the Lord for Mississippi. Or Alabama. Or Alabama. Is there any information that we should know uh, other than what's been presented to, to pass any kind of resolution? Is there any more compelling fact that we could say? This is why we passed this resolution, or is this this looks awesome. This looks really great, and I think that with this information, other SEC states doing the same thing. Well, you know, for me, it just it cuts waste, mm -hmm. and and this is a great tool to help us cut waste and be more efficient. And, um, it, you know, I in the last election, that was the the message I got from people. They're like, cut waste, you know, be more efficient. That's something that people want to see the government do, and. And, and we're doing this. This is a good opportunity to finance some of these projects. And it also, it helps us account for savings because right now we're not really accounting for what we save. We're not getting credit for that. Um, and, and a saved dollar is, you know, is money earned. Um, so I think it's, it helps give us some truth and transparency in accounting. And I, and I think, too, um, a clarification between the resolution and, and just the information that's been presented, you know, um, Based on my research, I know enough to decide for myself I think it's a good idea, but the resolution doesn't go so far. All the resolution says is we're going to ask the mayor and staff to uh, pull together a beginning list of projects and to just tell us more about funds, to actually do some routine research and to present that information to the council for discussion. And, and then the final point is it asks, um, the mayor and staff to reach out to the Clinton Foundation because they've offered organizations technical assistance if they want to pursue the HEAL model to learn more about the HEAL model to see if that would be feasible in addition to just having a, a fund for efficiency projects. So, so you would need, okay. So you're going to take this to the city, you're going to take this to the city council, is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, and, uh, so I'll, I'll do the lights, okay. So 
we use LED lights on all our street lights instead of what we have now. Well, that, that's that's an example of a project. Right, right. But I'm, it, I do better with looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. So we use those lights. But there is a cost for LED lights, yes. too. So when you come up with these projects, then you've got to come up with the money to get that started before the savings come in and however many right. years it right. takes. And you're trying to do it in four years or less to show savings? The first that? round, because we're okay. up against a wall with employee raises. Gotcha. And gotcha. Uh, that's exactly what the fund is for, is to capitalize the projects, because you hit the nail on the head. While replacing all the LEDs does guarantee that us some operational savings, it comes at the expense of staff time and materials. Right. And so that's what the fund is for, is to pay for that initial expense. To pay expense. for that initial, so that's what the fund would be used for with the savings. And who would be in charge of deciding what the fund, who, that would be a city? That would be the mayor. The mayor. Mm -hmm. He would make a decision on that. Yes, I don't want this to be a legislative process. Okay. In general, yeah, you know, I think that it tends to go slower when it's a legislative process. Right. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think as long as this, if we're just asking the mayor to tell us more about the model, whether or not it's feasible, um, we're not even asking the mayor and staff to make a recommendation. We just want the information to presented, be presented okay. to the council. The council can decide to establish the fund, but it's not our job and it shouldn't be our job to manage the fund. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. The one thing I would add is that um, it wouldn't be the city's first dance with a revolving loan fund. We do have a, um, a fund that was established um, as part of using some of our ERA funds. Um, what is ERA? Uh, you know, the bailout thing. Okay. The, as the energy efficiency block grant. Right. So we took $300,000? I think that's right. Is that right? And loaned it out to um, three different nonprofit organizations in the city Chamber of Commerce, Mount Sequoia Gardens, and the Botanical Gardens, all to do energy efficiency or weatherization projects. Um, and then those three entities are paying back that fund uh, at the city. The one stipulation with the way that program was set up was that the money paid back couldn't be touched for 10 years. Um, so what Matt's proposing here is a little different from, from the existing program we have because we would be able to use the, the savings under your proposal immediately or as soon as the savings are realized. Um, Depending on the model that we decide on. And actually, uh, earlier this week at the Economic Development uh, Working Group, the Chamber proposed a, an Economic Development re uh, Revolving Loan Fund. So it's, it's a very accepted practice. I move that we support GRF. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll let the city attorney know you asked the co-sponsor. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, we are down to the end of our agenda. Are there mm -hmm. any last items of comments or questions? Connie, you said you had... Oh, I do. Comments. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Connie, I'm sorry, before you start, I've got to go turn okay. the lights on for adult softball. It's time to play adult softball. All right. All right. Well, Starting up our that. fall league. So. This is another today. city project. Uh, well, it's mm -hmm. the city of Fayetteville. Uh, there's a group, and it's through um, Fayetteville Forward Committees and so on that are working on making Fayetteville a city uh, compassion. Oh, yes. Compassionate city. So, um, and they're going to have, and I'm on that committee, but anyway, they're going to have some um, compassion games, and that was in the paper on Sunday. I don't know if any of you saw that, but there's going to be a meeting on the 28th at the library at 6 o'clock, and Peter, I will send that information to you so you can send it out to everybody, and I'm sorry I didn't do that ahead. I just wasn't thinking. But anyway, it will tell you what you can do to be part of helping make, well, helping with the compassion games, which all it amounts to is doing good things. I mean, in Fayetteville, which the point is we do think good things all the time in Fayetteville. I mean, that's what we do. And what it really does is kind of show those things because you, um, you have a website you go to and you write in the things that you do. So anyway, what I was thinking, and um, I've asked several other committees, 
if there's something that the Environmental Action Committee would like to do to represent the Compassion Games. Um, what are the good things that we do as far as, I mean, we do lots of good things, but I'm, I'm thinking as far as uh, being part of, um, of these Compassion Games and so on. And you guys can kind of give me some ideas if you want to. You can do something as simple as, uh, you know, if, you, if we want to keep it green, you know, doing some recycling or whatever and can do it on an individual basis, or our committee could do something if we wanted to during the week of the, I think it's the, oh gosh, the 11th through the 21st, I think, or somewhere in that, in that line. <coughs> and I will send you all of that information so that if anybody has some ideas, or Aubrey, if we wanted to do something somewhere out in the community or whatever. And, so uh, that's uh, September 11th through the 21st, roughly. Yes. So that's during Bikes, Blues, and Barbecue. Oh, uh, well, well Which, of course, yeah. this is all on the, there will be a lot of compassion then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is all on the website, and I mean, we don't have to be, you know, involved with anything unless somebody would like to. And I've tried this before and have failed, and that is recycling at bikes, blues, and barbecue. Anybody? Yeah, <laughs> I'm really, I, I yeah. Town. Uh, yeah. Well, I usually <laughs> do too, but it's, uh, it's, um, you know, it's not anything that we have to. It wouldn't have anything to do necessarily with bikes, blues, and barbecue at all, of course. But that is part of that. So, yeah, I, so I would just like to bring this to the committee because um, part of what we do is making Fayetteville a better place to live and environmentally friendly and being environmentally responsible and so on. And so, um, I'd like to get that out there. There are cities throughout the world that are working on this these compassion games, but Fayetteville is by far the smallest. It's a little bitty city. I mean, we've got Seattle and Louisville and San Francisco, and I mean, you know, it goes on, and I will send all that information out to you. But it's not about who does the most, it's about what we do. So I just would like to bring that to your attention, and I will send it to Peter, who can send it to you guys. And please email me if you have any ideas or anything. If I come up with something, I'll email you guys. Okay? Sounds good. So I will follow up with you all um, with that information from Connie and then also with uh, the greenhouse gas savings information from Fleet mm. as soon as I get that. Great. Be great. Is there anything else that was relevant to this that we can think of right now that we could add to the list of things that we do to cultivate compassion? It, there's so much that we don't even think about. Yeah. Um, we do. So, support, but um, support the building of a, a real homeless shelter. Say that again. A year-round homeless shelter big enough to deal with the actual number of people of, that are homeless. We're displacing people from their campsites constantly. I know. By destroying the timber and chasing them off and building apartments that. Not even their ancestors or their future children or whatever. It, nobody in much of Bethel can even afford the student apartments. You know, we got all these these needs like that. So that's a that's something to advocate uh, at least. It certainly is. And and uh, another thing I would say in looking at this group and Terry's not here tonight, but the uh, wildlife natural habitat that we do is yes. because it's not just about people, it's about all living things. So uh, I think that could be included, if that's okay with you guys, for me to put that on there, that we have supported that for the last year and are receiving an award, I believe, this coming weekend. Is anybody going to that? I hadn't heard about it. Oh, well, we are in Little Rock. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go. I think maybe it was just the people that were on that particular committee that Probably. are going. Yeah. So, but, um, well, and also our uh, work uh, when Sarah Lewis was chair of on the low impact development to, you know, flooding really affects people uh, in South Fayetteville uh, where there are a lot of us are impoverished and uh, I think that the low impact development techniques and developing that guideline could help safeguard those people's homes and livelihoods. Oh, yeah. So those are all things that fit under the good that Fayetteville does for people that live in Fayetteville. So. Too. And we just uh, spoke out in favor of a national carbon fee and dividend, which helps you know, safeguard the future for our children. And uh, 
Would you send that to me? Yeah, thank I can you. do that. Thank you. And our um, also our streamside ordinance. Too. Yeah, the streamside protection yeah. ordinance. So, so when you start thinking about it, then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. and then there's this, and then there's this, and so many committees do so many so much good. Mm -hmm. So. All right, well, that's something we could all put some thought into, but uh, we have been here a long time now, so if there's nothing else, I'd say we should adjourn. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.